So welcome everyone to this introduction to butterfly watching. We're so happy to see that uh, over 120 people registered for this. I'm not sure if Zoom will allow that many because it does cap at 100, but we're very happy to see the enthusiasm that this has pulled. Um, Dave, the president and uh, of the Athol Bird and Nature Club, as we all uh, know him, will be presenting today about um, how to correctly identify uh, the butterflies. Without further ado, I hand it over to Dave. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We're pretty surprised and happy with the response. Um, I'm going to uh, do a couple of things here. Number one, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Well, welcome to our Earth Day celebration. And, um, you know, I, I do remember that 50 years ago, um, you know, when I was in college, it was the first Earth Days. And, and really, it was, um, it was a pretty interesting time. And, and um, I know that Fitchburg State at the time. And really, it, uh, it um, you know, it seems like a long time ago, but then again, it doesn't. So, but today we're going to talk about butterflies, an introduction to butterflies. So anyway, back in the, uh, we started looking at butterflies, I started back looking at butterflies in, in the back in the mid 80s. And we did a butterfly atlas. And uh, that was back in 1984, around that time period. And it's where we spread her across the state and tried to find as many butterfly species in each uh, USGS quadrant that we could. And um, that was back before I had a camera and we actually used nets to catch butterflies. We had no field guides. And um, as we as we go through this, okay, so this is us back in the early nine, uh, it would have been 1992 uh, or three. Um, and uh, this is Brian Cassie. He's the one that started the uh, the Atlas and really got the Butterfly Club rolling. This is out at Tom Swamp and Peter Sam. And um, we actually, um, at that point, we had classes um, held at Broadmeadow Brook and, and Worcester and at Harvard Forest and Peter Sam as before we had an environmental center. And um, also down at the uh, Hitchcock Center in Amherst. And um, you know, we used to have Thursday evening lectures and then Friday, uh, Saturday morning field trips. And uh, we probably had 50, 60 people go through that whole program back in that day. So I can see that this picture is in 90, 1999 because I'm holding, um, I mean, 90, yeah, 1993, because I'm holding the, the, uh, the field guide to butterflies, which is the first field guide that didn't come out till quite late in the whole process. So, okay, so, the tools of the trade. So really what you you know what you need to do is to have to have some binoculars so you can actually see what what um, the butterflies are and and like I said we we've come a long ways and don't use nets to catch them. Uh, we actually you know try to observe and photograph and look through binoculars at at um, the various butterflies and it, um, it it needs to be you need to be patient to do this. Um, but it's really quite rewarding and you can actually look at behavior and do a lot of other things that you don't uh, get to observe when you're just chasing them with a net. So uh, first we're going to talk about binoculars and um, when you look at the uh, numbers that you see in a binocular, the first number is the, is the power of the, of the magnification. You know, seven, eight, ten are quite, uh, are quite normal. Um, the second number you see here is the field of view, and that's the actual diameter of the of the lens in the front of the binocular. And the bigger the number, the larger the lens, and the more light actually gets into the binocular. So, um, fortunately for butterfly watching, um, this number is not as important because you actually are able to, uh, um, you know, when butterflies are flying. It's usually on a sunny day and the extra light isn't needed. If you were trying to do birds at dawn and dusk, that other number becomes much more important. So you're able to find 
binoculars uh, that are actually lighter and easier to use um, in the daylight. So uh, for butterfly watching, you don't need to have such uh, big numbers in the, on the back end. So quite often you'll see even a 10 by 25 or a 6 by 32. Um, and uh, those are quite acceptable for butterfly watching. This other number you see here is actually the field of view. And that's the angle um, that, that you see when you're looking out. And oftentimes it's, it's, uh, it's um, addressed as um, so many feet at 1,000 yards. And again, for butterfly watching, it's not quite as critical as it is in some other types of uses. But the real critical thing that you need to look at is close focus. Now, close focus um, is something that's relatively new in the last 15 to 20 years to binoculars. And you can now get binoculars at close focus to three to five feet. And um, I've been on many field trips, and you can tell the people with the best close focusing binoculars because everybody else is stepping back as you're uh, looking at the at the uh, butterfly. So um, if you look on on the different uh, makes and models, you can actually find this information pretty readily in the in the uh, description. So, um, but close focus of three to five feet is is really the best for butterflies. Most of your birding binoculars range from you know six to even twelve feet for a close focus range which is pretty far back if you're trying to, uh, trying to look at little butterflies. The other big thing, and this is the part that's changed dramatically over the last couple decades, is cameras. Now, um, I happen to have the, this particular Lumex here that's got a 30x, subject, a 30x magnification, which is different than the binocular magnifications. They figure it differently, but it has a pretty good magnification and a really good close focus range. I've had several of these um, these bridge cameras. This is a uh, happened to be a Lumix. I got these off the off the net, but I've had a Canon and I've had an Icon and a Panasonic. So I've had several of these different ones. They actually are pretty lightweight compared to a to a standard camera. Um, you know, they run probably four to five hundred dollars. These are two to three hundred dollars, and um, digital cameras, and they all work quite well for doing butterflies. Um, the other thing that's come, come even more recently is the, is the phones. And, and really the phones um, have come light years ahead just in the last two, three years. Um, I did get this particular new iPhone Pro and I'm pretty happy with its 10X magnification. And I haven't used it on uh, butterflies yet because there's not that many flying at this point, but I think it's going to be pretty handy, and it's something you have with you all the time. So, um, so you know, the thing about having a camera is one that that you actually take with you. So, um, so that's really uh, you know the start of that. So, but uh, any camera will do, and um, we're going to talk more about you know what to take when you're taking pictures and and how to figure out what you're looking at. So, um, so that's the start. So where do you go? to look for butterflies and you know I've done whole programs on butterfly habitats and if you read up on the different butterfly species you're going to find that various species actually have um, specific you know host plants and specific habitat types that they're associated with but for the most part any place that's sunny and overgrown like old power lines and I spent lots of times in overgrown gravel pits and old meadows and uh, behind stores and other places that uh, are pretty weedy and wild, that's where we're going to find them. And basically, where you have sunlight and you know temperatures over 60, we're going to start to see some butterflies. Patience is the biggest key when you're looking for butterflies these days, and and really to um, to, to uh, just be slow and deliberate in your moves and you'll be surprised how easily you can approach uh, a dragonfly. So um, you really, um, you know, be cautious and, and, um, and slow. And, you know, if you don't make fast moves and sometimes you stay in one spot for a while, you can let the, the uh, where there's a lot of flowers and blossoms happening, you can, the butterflies will just totally ignore you and come fairly close. The one thing that's changed over the years too is the uh, presence of ticks. And 
I can't express um, any any more that really we need to protect ourselves. You know, tuck in your socks and um, you know use pyrethrin on your clothing. Um, you can buy clothing that's already permeated with pyrethrin, um, and uh, you know it's just a matter of really being safe and uh, when you're out there. So um, you know they suggest in this thing to stay in the middle of the trail, which I've never been good at. But um, overall, I think uh, you know people are getting pretty astute about being safe in the in the outdoors. So butterfly guides, and boy, this has come a long ways. Um, you know, this is probably the uh, the earliest guide was uh, Glassberg's uh, field guide. This is is the butterfly supernoculars, and there was an early edition that had Boston, New York, Washington version that has the fewest number of species. We only have over a little hundred, over just over a hundred species or so in Massachusetts that you need to be concerned with. So having a uh, uh, guides that are pretty uh, distinct to the area um, are, uh, are, is, is really helpful to save some of the confusion. The newer guide to the east has a few more species and actually over the last 20 years or so we've had several species actually uh, that weren't in the original guide become more and more prominent. So um, these, the, the, uh, the newer guides include a few more things and, um, and I'll show you uh, more resources as we continue. And just so that you know, uh, we're going to send an email out at the end of this program um, to all the people that signed up that will have the names of the books and um, other links and web links and stuff. So you don't have to be too concerned about trying to write them all down as we go through. And uh, we will eventually also have the uh, this, um, it's being recorded so that we'll have a chance to uh, put it up on the website and so people can relive this experience. So a couple of the resources that I've found pretty useful. Uh, the Butterflies of the East Coast uh, by Rick Check is, uh, is actually an excellent uh, book that goes a little deeper into the life histories and some of the other uh, aspects of butterflies. And I found it uh, very interesting and, and a, good, um, a, a good table, coffee table type book. It's not, not one you bring in the field, but it's a good resource for when you get back home. And I can't say enough about uh, Tom Murray, who's many of the photographs we'll see today uh, were taken by Tom. He's a good friend <clears throat> and a member of the Butterfly Club and member of the Athol Bird Nature Club. And um, he's taken thousands and thousands of photos. And uh, for the most part, if you see photos that are clear and in focus, they're Tom's, and if they're a little fuzzy, they're probably mine. So um, with that, we'll keep going. But he has a great book here on the insects of New England and New York, and he has a, a website that we'll have in the links we'll send you, and um, he's a good resource if you're not quite sure what you're looking at. So the other great thing about um, looking at butterflies, we are interested, and there's a good opportunity for citizen science. The Massachusetts Butterfly Club has been collecting data on the sightings of all of our members since 1993. And um, since that time, um, every time someone posts a sighting on the MassLEP uh, email listserv, which I'll talk about that later, or on their Facebook page, you know, posting pictures or whatever, that information is gathered by volunteers and goes into a database that uh, has thousands of entries. And that database has been used now by uh, Harvard University and others to actually look at um, you know, the uh, climate change effect on butterfly species and flight times. And it's got a lot of very useful information <clears throat> that um, you know, it's got thousands and thousands of entries. So it's really becoming quite the resource uh, for that. The other one that's kind of new, and, and I know Mount Grace and, and uh, ABNC and others are really starting to kick into this, is the iNaturalist. And uh, Mount Grace had a webinar last week or two ago on the use of iNaturalist. And I really think it's, um, I've started to use it myself and um, it's pretty interesting. It does give you suggestions for the species you're seeing. And, um, and you get feedback from the, from 
other naturalists about uh, whether your identification is correct or even help you get down the road. So iNaturalist is an up and coming thing for many of us and uh, really think that uh, it's gonna be the wave of the future. You know, I'm an eBird person, so I, I'm pretty used to uh, submitting things when I'm out in the field on my phone and you can do it back at the office too. So, uh, but the citizen science is alive and well in the butterfly world. And this animal is a, one of my favorite woodland butterflies, the Northern curly eye, really um, great to see in the forest. Okay, a little bit about the life cycle. <clears throat> you know, we um, pretty much know that uh, um, everybody's seen, this is gonna be a monarch egg that we're looking at right here on this, on this uh, milkweed plant. Um, you know, I found eggs quite a few times and, and well, like many times, and it's just when you see a, a butterfly flitting about on the, you know, around the leaves of a, of a plant instead of near the flower and um, being very active and very fluttery. Uh, quite often it could be a female that's laying eggs and by observing that you can kind of, you know, go over and see what they were doing and, um, and actually have found quite a few eggs. So, um, but it's interesting to see what plant that they're on, um, whether it be like, the, you know, monarchs are, are often a milkweed, but violets are a big one. And even some of the forest trees have lots of different uh, butterflies that will lay eggs um, on them. So the next stage in the life cycle, of course, is the caterpillar. And this is the part where they actually um, chew. And this is where um, a lot of the uh, um, leaves get, get uh, eaten and so forth. And um, I know I've had people with butterfly gardens all concerned that they're, um, all the plants in the butterfly garden were getting eaten. Well, that's <clears throat> part of the reason to have them is that they need to have this uh, life stage um, and uh, it's pretty cool. So this is the uh, monarch caterpillar. It will then turn into a chrysalis. And then after a fashion, it'll come out and we'll get to a, you know, an adult monarch butterfly. And again, you know, the whole life cycle of these guys come moving up from the Gulf of Mexico this time of year and, you know, not reaching us for another month or so after going through a couple of broods. And then the final brood in the fall, you know, heads all the way back south. So pretty remarkable, but there's lots of other beasts out there that are all going through the same, the same basic life cycle without the migration kicked in. So <clears throat> butterfly guarding has gone through a lot of changes over, over the last couple of decades too. Um, you know, Buddleia, which is this plant that we see here on the left, um, the butterfly bush, you know, that was probably a mainstay in most butterfly gardens. Um, we're kind of going away from that nowadays. Um, you know, going back to some native plants and we're actually uh, working more in, in increasing the, uh, our gardening to include a lot of other pollinators and it's you know, much more diverse. This is the, uh, the pollinator garden at the US Fish and Wildlife Service in Hadley. Uh, my wife was um, one of the people that helped to steer this project along. And um, you know, so this was, you know, used to be lawn and then they really, um, you know, made it a lot more interesting with, you know, such great stuff as Joe Pye weed and, and um, you know, cone flower and the different sunflowers uh, or um, Rebecca and, and uh, whatnot. So um, anyway, so this is all pretty, you know, pretty good stuff. And, and again, native plants are the key. And um, I just, um, I really think that that's, uh, you know, a lot of good way to spend some of your summer and maybe the spring we'll spend a lot more time in the garden. So, um, so part of the whole thing when you're doing uh, any new uh, group of animals is to try to figure out some of the, the um, uh, vernacular of, of, of the, uh, the beast and what parts there are that you need to know. And, uh, and really, um, it's not that complicated in butterflies. Um, if you've done any birding and know basic uh, uh, structures, um, 
it's it's not too tough. But we're gonna I'm gonna go through and look at a real butterfly and just describe some of the basic parts, and we'll go through them one at a time. So here we are <clears throat> with a with a morning cloak, which are flying right now. I've seen them for the last couple of weeks that we've been flying. Um, and like most insects, you start off with your head, thorax, and abdomen. And um, that's a very basic insect that, you know, um, structure. Um, and on butterflies, we have four wings and hind wings. And, um, you know, each can be different, and they can be different if you're looking from the dorsal view, or you can look from the ventral view, which is from the bottom, and they'd be quite different. And uh, we'll look at that too. So um, the butterflies all have antennas, and it should be noted for those that are fairly new, uh, all the butterflies have an antennal club. And this is significant only that if you're out in the field and you see something that you think is a butterfly, if it doesn't have a club, it's quite likely a moth. And um, and that's one of the big the big ways to separate moths from butterflies. And uh, a moth is either going to have a feathered antenna or a or a, uh, um, a a spiked antenna with no club. And all the butterflies will have a club. And even in some species, we actually find that the color of the club can be a significant field mark. Okay, so a little bit deeper into the into the realm of the parts. The costal margin is the front of the of the wing. The apex is where the wing corner is. The margin is that area closest to the back of the wing. Here we have a marginal band, which is the um, this area that's just inside the wing. And then there's the submarginal band and submarginal eye spots. So as you're looking through the field guide, these are some of the terms you might run across, and this is where you might find them on the actual uh, butterfly. So looking from the bottom, this is a gray hair streak, one of the really beautiful ones. And this one has a prominent post-median line. And on a butterfly, the median would be halfway along in the wing. And so this line is beyond the median. And the Acadian flycatcher, a uh, flycatcher, Acadian hair streak has a submarginal band. Remember the margin would be up here. And this band is, you know, below that. It's on both the forewing and the hindwing. And it also has a post-median band. Again, the median being here. And this is outside of that, so post. So again, these are just some basic terminologies that you'll find in a lot of the field guides. And it's just a good way to try to figure out um, where you are in the, in the process. So <clears throat> for the next bit here, we're going to go through the various families of butterflies. And um, it's good to try to figure out, especially if you've got a book, to try to figure out where in the book to start to look for things. And this is basically how most of the books are set up by their, um, you know, by, by their families. So here we go. The, the tiger swallowtails um, are one of the early uh, ones to emerge. And uh, we have two species in Massachusetts that are, that are early spring um, emergence. This is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail and the Canadian Tiger Swallowtail. We'll talk a little bit about them as we move ahead here. It's not uncommon to find a lot of swallowtails and other butterflies pooling um, on wet ground. Um, if you remember that <clears throat> the caterpillars are able to chew and and eat leaves and stuff. But the adults have a proboscis that only allows them to intake liquids. And so what's happening here, and these are, these are basically male butterflies that are gathering uh, minerals from the damp soil next to a stream. This is over in Petersham. And um, 
like the boys at the bar. They're, they're getting minerals that they need for reproduction. Here's another group of them. And this one is uh, pretty interesting in that um, early in the spring, we have, we have the two species that, that fly very early. And actually, these are um, um, the two, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail and the Canadian Tiger Swallowtail. And if you look at the marginal band on the Eastern, it, uh, from the ventral side, it's broken. And on the Canadian, it's a solid line. And that's one of the areas that you can see, you know, how these terminologies might help you differentiate. And we're going to use the um, Massachusetts Butterfly Club website quite often in the talk. And at the very end, I'll go through some of the more details of it. But it's an excellent resource um, for trying to compare things. And you can do side by side comparisons of different species and different views of different species. And it, uh, it's really quite robust and, and a very good program. And we'll talk more about that towards the end. And just to keep you on your toes, this is a, a black form of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And um, it's really, um, um, you know, just very different and beautiful. You might mistake it for a black swallowtail, but it doesn't have an extra line of yellow spots and um, you know by looking at your field guide you can you can different differentiate these. Hey Dave, we have a yeah. question. Sure. Um, what exactly were the butterflies getting from a manure pile near some horses? Yeah, uh, they they yeah, they often they're often attracted to scat of all kinds. I'll show pictures later on that they're on some some bird scat, but there's minerals in that in that manure, and then the uh, I've actually seen them on on dead carcasses of uh, I know I, I had a dead deer once that had some uh, Baltimore trucker spots, you know, uh, sucking up that ooze. But it's but it's the minerals and stuff that are in that stuff, and I'm not I know uh, that person exactly what they they're getting out of it, but it's quite common to find them. Um, you know, if you're walking down a trail, there's some dog scat even, you know, quite often you'll find different butterflies right on that scat. And, uh, and again, they have to, you know, uh, it has to be moist so that they can suck it up without having to chew it. So, um, yeah, so this, but that's a good way to find butterflies is to look at scat or dead stuff or whatever. So um, I'll talk more about that too as we get into some of the other species. Okay, so we're going to talk about the whites and the yellows, and um, and <clears throat> we'll start off with one of the most ubiquitous of the species. This is the clouded sulfur. Um, we find it, you know, another month or so we'll be seeing this just about everywhere. Um, you know, it uh, has a pale yellow appearance to it. Um, the margins of the of the uh, forewing are dark. It has a, a, a spot in the middle of the wing, right in the median, and um, they're quite common, and we should definitely see them. Um, a very close relative that's also really pretty common is the orange sulfur. And this one um, was once referred to as the alfalfa felt sulfur. And um, what's interesting too about this one is that early in the season, it does have a little bit richer color yellow but on the um, dorsal view, it's got quite a bit of orange. And as the season progresses and the different broods go through the summer, they get more and more orange. So by the time fall comes around, they're really very sharply distinctive than the orange sulfurs. And uh, again, open field habitats, pastures, hay fields, you'll find quite a few of these floating around. The, uh, <clears throat> the introduced European cabbage white is probably the, you know, if you have a garden, these guys are there. Um, um, I've actually had one uh, enclosed in the house not too long ago from, from last winter's, last fall's, um, you know, bringing the house plants in. But, uh, but anyway, the cabbage white is pretty distinctive. Um, definite blacks on the tips of the, on the apex of the wing. 
and um, dark body. Oftentimes you can see white wings in a dark body that helps it for them to be flying earlier and later in the season because they can use the, the reflection of the light wings to reflect light onto their body to warm them up. So they get a little bit longer uh, flight period than they might otherwise have. So, um, you know, just a neat, neat butterfly that could be kind of a pest for any of those, you know, cabbage type plants in your garden. So not so wonderful there. We have a couple other, excuse me, native whites that are more common in the western part of the state. This is the West Virginia white and um, beautiful, you know, animal and, um, and um, really fun to go see this little population in Sunderland. And then for, as you go further west, there's quite a few more. And there's a mustard white, which is a little more dramatic. That's only out in the Berkshires. So um, really kind of neat to see those. And um, there's one that I, I actually went out of state to find, and this is uh, the Falcate orange tip, which you have to really go to New Haven area uh, to find it in the rock cliffs there. And it's just a beautiful um, animal that actually, uh, there are historic records for this out on Mount Tom and a few other places in the state. And it hasn't been found um, in modern times anyway, but um, it would be a good one to always keep an eye for. And that's relatively early flyer. They're already flying in Connecticut. And um, it'd be a great one to add to our state avifauna if we could uh, really get there. Hey Dave, we have a few more questions. Yeah. Uh, Lola, gonna have you talk. Yeah. Here we go, how are we doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Um, you started talking about butterfly families, but now I, th I think you're just going randomly through. Nope, these are all the whites and yellows. Oh, okay. And the, yep. and the swallowtail was the first family? Yep. And the second family is now whites and yellows? Yep. Okay. All right. And we, and we got another one from Mary. Hi there. Um, my questions were on uh, the the um the West Virginia um yeah. and the last um what are their um host plants ah good question um i'm actually to the i might have to look it up um cuz we don't really uh, oh i'm trying to think i should know that um ah uh, I don't know if Sue Clutie or something was on that know that answer, but <laughs> but um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I don't know if whoever if West Virginia got to name it first or or uh, if it's you know a particular type of plant that um, are they yeah. seen as far out east. As the Athol Gardner area, or no, they're, uh, they're in the Connecticut Valley West, you know. Okay, and um, all right, so they must like something there, yeah. And I could, I'll try to think, figure, get that figured out by the time we finish. <laughs> okay, all right, so but anyway, yeah, it's, it, it's um, I do know that whole that thing, it's it's a little white flower that's in these ravines and I should know it. In the chat it says uh uh Joanne says uh Trientalis woodland yep. mustards garlic mustard and she's right it's toxic to you. <laughs> great thank you Joanne all right so the falcate and then we're gonna move along <clears throat> to the gossamer wings and um, by Saturday, this is a whole group of, of um, uh, that includes the blues and the and the uh, hair streaks and some other of the great um, different ones that I really fun to see. And um, we're going to start off with the spring azure, and these are flying at least in the valley into the east of us, and um, they should be flying here any day now. I certainly most years have them well before this even. Um, you know, interesting, a lot of these in this group have these striped antenna. Um, the spring azure has actually three forms. This is um, uh, violacea that's very pale. 
It has a marginata, which has a pretty brown, uh, a, a dark gray uh, mar uh, submarginal band. And then there's neglector, I think, that's got the smudge of, of brown and the, uh, or gray in the middle. They're all the same species. This is actually a species that's gone through a lot of DNA and a lot of the professionals are really um, not sure how many species of, of azure we actually have. There's the spring azure, the summer azure, the cherry gall azure, and most of them are pretty indistinguishable uh, by sight, except for host plant and other uh, clues that might tell you what you're, what you're looking at. But the spring azure are the first ones to come out quite often on blueberry blossoms. And uh, they, the next warm day, maybe Saturday, we'll get a chance to see some. Talking about, um, you know, the uh, sucking up poop. This is um, a pair of azures uh, down here on some bird poop. And again, um, you know, whenever you're walking around and see um, scat on the ground, it's a good place to look to see who's utilizing that. Another one of the ones that's a really a favorite is the Eastern Tailed Blue. And um, again, this is one of our smaller, uh, smaller butterflies. It, uh, it's pretty widespread. Um, this one's sitting on uh, sweet fern. And the Silvery Blue. And this is an interesting one because <clears throat> when we first started the uh, Atlas in the 80s, this was not in Massachusetts. And it's actually coming from further north. And <clears throat> one of my big theories about a lot of this stuff is that um, even with some bird species, that a lot of these actually were able to expand with the interstate highway system that was constructed in the 50s. And um, it actually made a, uh, uh, a direct connect from populations in other places, you know, back to, uh, to Massachusetts, and it's not proven, but I'm sticking to it. But uh, this is a silvery blue, and it's really distinctive. They have these black spots with the white um, circles around the black spots. And just to give a little comparison, again, using the Mass Butterfly Club site, you can see that the eastern tail blue and the silvery blue look pretty close from from a top from the from the dorsal view. But the eastern tail blue has these beautiful orange spots on the on the uh, trailing edge of the margin and little tails. And um, the thing about tails, and uh, oftentimes you'll see that with hair streaks, they'll actually rub those those hind wings back and forth, and the tails start to look like um, antenna. And when a bird comes around, it may actually think that the back is the front or whatever, and uh, the butterfly gets to live another day. And again, you know, when you're out there looking at things, you know, if you're um, doing this um, uh, slowly and methodically and watching, observing, we get to watch the mating of butterflies and some other behaviors that you may not get if you were trying to chase them down. So um, again, nice patience and um, you really can get up relatively close to many of these species. Here's one of my favorite, the American copper. This is right in my backyard. Um, you know, this is just a gorgeous small butterfly. Um, you know, not much bigger than a dime probably, but um, very colorful and uh, really a joy to see. Here's the, the ventral view of the, uh, of the copper. This is the American copper. We have a couple other species. We have a bog copper and, a, and um, also that comes from Massachusetts. Okay, another one that's gonna be flying relatively soon. This is the Eastern Pine Elfin. And um, it actually uh, feeds on pine needles. So what you, you're gonna you're gonna find it, you know, where you want where you find, you know, white pine, red pine, and uh, pitch pines. You'll feed on any of those. And uh, again, you know, relatively um, nondescript in the sense that it, it can really camouflage itself in the in the uh, forest litter. Um, in the early books, the, uh, they actually described this as unmistakable 
with its markings, but that was before um, the mid 80s, it would have been actually almost the early 2000s. There was actually a population of uh, bog elfin found in Massachusetts. Uh, for the first ones discovered were over at Harvard Pond in Petersham, and there's been other populations found uh, further uh, north and east in these bog habitats, but it feeds on black spruce. And um, so they're very closely related to the eastern pine elfin visually. They look quite the same. Um, they, there's just a couple of uh, things different. They're much smaller in size. And you see these arrowhead markings on, on the pine elfin. The, um, the um, bog elfin lacks these, and there's a difference in the margin. But um, they're extremely rare. They're on the endangered species list. So you're very unlikely to run across a bog elfin. So Dave, when you say these creatures are feeding on black spruce, are you saying that they drink the sap? No, they they're, they um, the caterpillars are, are the ones that eat that eat the uh, needles. Okay. You know, so if, yeah, the caterpillars are the the host plant always refers to what the caterpillar eats. So, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. The adults again just you know suck up stuff like a straw. There's another one of my favorites. This is um, the brown elfin, and it's usually found in in um, in areas that are um, uh, pretty impoverished, like around gravel banks or overgrown uh, things with you know old sand plain type habitats. Um, again, it flies very very early, and uh, it's um. I think the colors are pretty neat, even though they're very nondescript. It's uh, it's a nice little bug to find, and these are happening really right now, the end of April and early May. So the hair streaks in general. This is a couple of our um, our summer hair streaks, and the uh, the striped hair streak um, on top, and the coral hair streak here. Um, Relatively woodland oriented, you know, in the dappled sunlight, you find them quite often. Um, you know, to me, finding hair streaks is like finding an owl when you're birding. You know, I mean, it, you don't always expect them, um, but when you do find one, it's kind of a great thing. There are some hot spots across the state where you can find more and more of these, but again, they a lot of them are very specific to host plant, and um, and I know like this the, the coral hair streak. There's a um, there's a a small hill on the on the um, campus of the of uh, the uh, Mount Hermon campus, and this you know it's just a small little lot, but you can almost be guaranteed to find coral streaks there, and it's in, in among the uh, the uh, the scrub uh, bushes there. So um, sometimes they're you know if you know where where they are, they're quite um, habitual sometimes in their in their habit, but um, but it's great to find hair streaks. And you can see on the, on the striped hair streak especially, you see that, the, that these markings at the tail end of the, of the hind wing actually do look kind of like an eye and, and antenna. And again, that's a, uh, a, 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 to trick predators into thinking that which end is which. So one of my absolute favorite butterflies is the harvester. And um, it's very unique. It's, uh, it's actually a carnivorous butterfly. And we'll talk a little about its whole life history here. And, and it's um, the only um, member of its tribe that's in the Americas. All the other uh, you know, related species are in Africa and Asia. So it's uh, pretty unique in, the, in that aspect. Uh, the males usually, uh, stay perched um, anywhere from five to 20 feet up in the in the area and usually you know in the presence of alder um, very specifically uh, speckled alder is is you know where they're usually found and the reason for that is is that their um, larval host is actually the alder aphid and you see here there's a a little group of alder aphids being being managed by the ants that uh, that kind of watch over and protect the aphid colony, the aphids secrete honeydew that the ants are happy to uh, partake of, 
It's a pretty rich resource. And in amongst that um, is the larva of the harvester. And the larva of the harvester uh, pierces the aphids um, with a with a little beak and then sucks out the juices of the uh, of the aphid and actually um, the dead skins of the aphids um, actually wind up adorning the top of the uh, the caterpillar uh, when I took this picture I actually scraped it off to see where the where the larva was but um, these the dead casings of the caterpillar camouflage the um, uh, caterpillar even more. And there were some questions that were raised by a graduate student at Harvard University, you know, about why the ants aren't taking, um, you know, better care of the aphid colony. Well, there's actually, um, his studies found that there was a pheromone that the, that the caterpillar uh, exudes and it fools the ant into thinking it's a, uh, it's just an aphid. And um, it just, the ants totally ignore it. So really, you know, bizarre and interesting and complex stuff. And um, here's the money shot from, this was in, I think it was 1999 in May on a Butterfly Institute field trip. And this is a female harvester actually laying her egg inside the aphid colony. And um, it was, it was probably a dozen of us on that field trip. And you know, she was flying around pretty helter skelter, and if it wasn't for the sharp eyes of some of my colleagues there, I never would have seen it land. And she was only on this for a few seconds, and uh, I was able to get that shot. You can see it's pretty early in the season; it was May fifth, and um, so this was a, a pretty interesting um, encounter with this with this animal. And um, again, you know, swampy areas, sometimes near gravel pits and stuff, you'll find. Um, the the alders, but look for the aphids, and there can be quite extensive colonies of aphids. And the more aphids they are, the better chance you have of finding the harvester butterflies. So one of my favorites, and one of my money pictures. This is actually was in was asked to be in the Bronx Zoo uh, Riverscape exhibit. So it, this picture's gotten around. Okay. <clears throat> Moving ahead, we're looking Dave, at we, the. Yeah. We have one question from sure. Kim. Yeah. Yes. Hi, thank you very much, David, for doing this and Corey for setting it up. Um, my question actually goes back to when we were looking at the whites and the yellows. Yeah. When you, the slide that you had that showed um, the two butterflies and and, and you said uh, one. I wasn't sure if they were both the orange butterfly or if one of them was the clouded and the other was the orange. Right, there were two, there were two separate slides. One slide had a, um, a, a clouded sulfur with its wings closed and its wings open. The next slide had an orange sulfur with the wings closed and the wings open. Okay, okay, I get it. So the second slide was both pictures were of the orange sulfur. Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you so yep. much. When we get to the uh, to the part about looking at the website, all those kind of pictures are really easy to compare. So we'll, okay. we'll take a look at that. Alrighty, so the brush-footed butterflies. This is probably one of the better, um, you know, this group has the most color, the most diversity. Um, they're the ones we probably notice most in the garden and out in the field. And um, they called brushfoots for a pretty particular reason. And if you look closely at this red spotted purple, you see that it appears to only have four legs. And we know insects have six. Well, there's two legs that have actually morphed and to be non-usable for walking. And it's a little bit not clear exactly how each species use them or why they morph that way, but they really only stand on four legs. So um, that kind of separates them from all the others. And um, it's um, just one of those things. But these are some great looking butterflies. Here's the Compton tortoiseshell. 
And um, I learned when I was putting this together that it's not Compton's, because it's actually named for, for a town in Quebec. So it's Compton Tortoiseshell. And um, again, these you know have a pretty long flight period. Um, you can find them very early in the season. And uh, just a really, uh, just a beautiful animal. A close cousin to it is the Milbert's tortoiseshell, which was named for a person. So it's apostrophe S. And, um, you know, we have years you don't see any of these and then other years you'll find quite a few. So it's um, very erratic and uh, several of these species are like that, though they have very um, different um, erratic flight behavior year to year. So this next group is, um, is another interesting one. Um, I always like to find these from the uh, ventral view because this is actually the east, uh, actually this might be a green comma. It's a comma. And um, you see right on the, on the uh, ventral side of the wing is what appears to be the punctuation comma. So pretty nice that they um, identified it that way. It's close relative is the question mark. And if you have a comma with an extra dot, it certainly would be a question mark. They're quite similar in a lot of other ways, you know, parents wise. They um, both feed a lot on sap. Um, if you, um, you know, I do a lot of moth baiting and stuff. So you put out a rotten fruit. Um, these guys would be very happy to, uh, to partake of rotting um, juices. So, um, but when you see them uh, from the top, from the dorsal view, they're actually quite gorgeous and they're quite similar. So when you're looking at the Eastern comma, it's missing the, this subapical spot that you'd find in a uh, question mark. So this is where the spot would be. And then if you see the question mark, you actually can see this extra spot. So there's four spots on a question mark and only three spots on a comma. So, you know, just remembering it that the comma has the extra spot. I mean, the question mark has an extra spot, whether looking at the top or the bottom. So there we go. So really interesting. They fly early. I've seen plenty of commas already. Um, I saw like maybe three or four different commas um, just cruising around. So um, often as you find them on dirt roads this time of year. Okay, as summer blooms, so do the, uh, the great spangled fritillary. Um, one of the, um, the great fritillaries, we have three species of great fritillary. They're, um, uh, you know, you can tell them apart by the specific field mark, but they're um, the uh, two other species, the uh, Atlantis and uh, Aphrodite are more to the western part of the state and the northern part of Massachusetts. We get, we can get all three here, but they're not very common except for the great spangle. Here's the dorsal view. These are um, just, you know, large, beautiful orange butterflies. There's a subset of fritillaries that are smaller. Uh, this is the silver bordered fritillary. And what's neat about it, um, it's a wetland uh, obligate. Uh, you find it quite often with other interesting species. So, um, and it's a little bit smaller than the great spangle, You've got great color, those silvery spots on the uh, underside. And under this one, if you can see this black dot within this white cell, that's a dead giveaway that that's a silver bordered fritillary. So um, just an interesting, I like it when there's an absolute way to tell one from another. So if you see the black spot, you're golden. There's quite a few species that actually come up from the mid-Atlantic states in the late summer and fall. And this one happens to be the variegated fritillary. And you know, that's a, the typical place to find these would be um, along a shoreline of like the Quabbin or the water stats going down. Um, you can find them in fairly good numbers there and other places where you have 
um, shorelines that are uh, get weeded up in the in the late summer, um, all the way right up into like the first frost, you'll find them. They don't seem to overwinter here. Um, there's still uh, a species that's expanding uh, northward, and uh, but they do breed here, and uh, but they don't just don't seem to overwinter. So I don't usually see them in the early part of the season until you get into like July and August and September. And again, you can find them breeding. This is down at the Quabbin. Um, you know, again, you know, it's good to see the behavior. Um, so we've seen them doing this, but we just don't see them overwintering, at least not yet. But these are one of the species that we'll be watching for changes in the climate uh, as it moves forward. Another cool one that's here, um, this is the Harris checker spot. It uh, host plant uh, is the flat topped aster. Uh, we have them in Petersham, we have them a few other places. Um, it's a very bold uh, little checker spot and um, just fun to see, not very big. You can see it's fitting on the head of a daisy, the flower. The Baltimore checker spot, <clears throat> You know, named for the black and orange colors of Lord Baltimore. Um, again, not a common species we have here, but certainly one that I know I've found in several places locally and down the Connecticut Valley, Northfield, and down the Quabbin. And the ladies. This is an American lady. And some interesting things about her identification is, um, or he, um, there's a white dot in the first four wing cell on the American lady. Now, it doesn't always appear, but it can be seen from quite a ways off, either the top or bottom. So it's a pretty good field mark. The other thing you can think about is the American lady has big eyes. And the very similar uh, painted lady would have four eye spots here instead of just the two. So the American lady has big eyes and she's got that other nice little white dot in that first orange four wing cell. And um, there have been cases where that white dot doesn't, does not show, but if it does show it's American, but the eye spots are always the same. There's another place where, where uh, Massachusetts, especially the North, Quabbin area where we, where, where we are right now, um, we have this um, um, the same species with two different forms. This is the red spotted purple that we're seeing up here on the top left. And um, you know, it's, it's the southern form of this, of this species. And the white admiral um, is the same, except that it has this addition of a big white band um, a post-median band. And the theory is here is that, again, I mentioned before that when you have a white band like that on the, on the wing, they can actually um, use that to thermoregulate in the cooler climate and get more flight time per day. So, uh, but we're fortunate here in Massachusetts that we get uh, both species, both forms of this species and hybrids in between the two. So you can sometimes can get a little more white or a little less white, whatever. So there could be kind of a, an integrate between the two forms. Beautiful butterflies though. And again, the monarch is, uh, is really, um, everybody knows it, it's uh, pretty unmistakable. Um, you know, there's another one very similar, the Viceroy that would have another, an additional black mark that bisects these veins. So a little bit smaller, but uh, also quite interesting. So that's our brushfoots. So the last family, and we're moving right along here, is the is the skippers, and these are the little brown jobs that um, you know of the butterfly world. Um, some of them are a little more difficult to identify, but there are several that are pretty um, pretty distinctive. And this one that's shown here, this is the Arctic skipper, and it looks like a miniature. Fritillary. It's got white spots underneath and a lot of action on the top. So that's an interesting one. I've seen them in Royalston and really more common out to the western part of the state. But the, um, the, 
the real little brown jobs are the dusky wings. This is a juvenile's dusky wing. Um, again, uh, early spring, I've seen them very early. I was trying to think just how early, but like mid-April and um, on a warm spring. This isn't a warm spring this year, but um, but there, there are several species and you need to, you know, bear down a little bit to distinguish between them. A couple of um, similar species. The more common is this one down here on the on the lower right. This is the silver spotted check, uh, silver spotted skipper. And this, you know, like splash of bird dropping looking paint on the side of the ventral wing is really distinctive. It's a common uh, in most gardens and you can really, uh, really find them uh, all across the region. The hoary edge on the other hand, which is very similar, uh, has this little white blotch on the, on, the, um, on the band here, on the edge of the wing. And um, it's much less common. And it's a good, uh, I've found them different places, but they're, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, if you find one, it's a, it's a good day. The hoary edge and the silver spotted skipper. The Habermuck skipper, on the other hand, is um, um, a fairly large in the in the skipper group. Um, you know, very distinctive with the dark at the base of the base of the wing. Um, you know, from the top, it has a very distinctive, you know, uh, black band around the edge. And when you're taking photographs of um, butterflies to identify, particularly on the skippers. It's good to try to get photographs of both the ventral view and the dorsal view when possible. And quite often the skippers will do this dorsal view. They'll get on a, on a leaf and spread out to get, you know, to thermoregulate. So it's quite often you'll see them in that position. But um, it's good to try to get both angles to get all the field marks you might need to have to, um, to make their positive identification. This is the Indian skipper. And this one, um, I only kind of included it because it does have a, a distinctive field mark. If you look right here on the, on the top of the wing and even on the bottom of the, on the ventral part of the wing, it has these markings that actually look like beggar's ticks. And, um, and I just remember that as a, as a good field mark when, you, uh, when, you're out in the, when you're out in the woods, you know, out in the fields looking at these guys. But again, these are, um, you know, probably not for the faint of heart. You get to start to really look at these closely. If you like looking at sparrows, these are a good, uh, good alternative for the midsummer. Dave, we have yep. a question. Yep. What function does the fur serve on the thorax and abdomen? Good question. Um, it's not really fur. Those are actually scales. And um, they're, uh, let me go back one. Yeah, they're scales. And, um, you know, they're just body coverings. Um, you know, just like, I don't think it has any other real purpose except for, um, you know, protection of the head, thorax, and the thorax and abdomen. And this is a mulberry wing, uh, a good wetland uh, uh, butterfly. Uh, not real common, but we have them around. I've seen them lots of places, but you know, I only see a very few every year. And it's got this real interesting, I think of it kind of like the Crusades symbol on the, on the wing. It's pretty, pretty uh, distinctive pattern on that underwing. There's another one that I really like. It's, it's a Delaware skipper. And um, it, from, the, from the ventral view, it really doesn't show much of anything. Um, you know, really plain orangey. And if you look at from the top, it comes out with this beautiful, uh, you know, spider web looking pattern on the wing with a, with a nice um, band around the edge. So, um, but really easy to identify once you get both looks. There's a few that, this is really plain underneath. It doesn't have any different shading or shadowing or anything. It's very, very plain. And all the, all the distinctiveness is on the top. But the, but the absence of field marks on the bottom of the, of the ventral surface 
is really a good clue too. And just like when you have, um, um, you know, with rare birds and stuff, we have rare butterflies that come up. And a lot of them happen, uh, you know, usually in August, September. And uh, this is a fiery skipper. It's a one for, again, from the mid-Atlantic uh, states. Um, different years, we have different numbers of them. But, uh, but it's something to look for. We've got, you know, there's Ocala skippers and there's, you know, long tail skippers and other things that can show up. So um, particularly in late summer, when most of our other uh, uh, things are, um, are kind of going by, we can be surprised by finding some of these neat guys from the south that uh, are kind of trying to take advantage of the climate and stability here. So that brings us to the end of the families. And um, I'd like to take just a minute or two to go over the Mass Butterfly Club website, which um, is really a, um, um, a great resource. And, you know, again, it's been going you know, since the early 90s. And um, I'm going to do a little technical stuff here so that I can uh, share this with you. All right, now, yeah, okay, we are there and we're live, right? Yep. Dave, that we works. have a question from yeah. Mary. I'm gonna put her on the call. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we got you, Mary. How are you? Okay, good. Um, again, a host plant question. Do all the skippers, um, caterpillars, um, use the same host plant? No, in fact, they're quite varied. And um, quite often the host plant is the, um, is the key to where you're finding them. Um, some are, some are, have wetland plant obligates and some, um, you know, grasslands. And, and so there's quite a variation in the host plant and that helps to, you know, um, explain the, the species variation, you know, as you go through that. So, so they're very, very, there's a number of skippers and they all have their own, um, their own thing that they do. <laughs> could you, um, could you just name a few of the plants? Well, like uh, early spring, the cobweb skipper likes a uh, little blue stem. Um, I know that, uh, and I have to think a little harder, but, it, but they are different. I know like uh, Dion skipper is only in uh, in marshes and, he, and it feeds on sedges. Um, mm -hmm. so, so it's quite varied and each one would have their own life history. And, and um, I'm going to show you on, on this website where you can find some of that information. Oh, um, great. Thank you. Uh, we have a, we'll have a link in a minute and I'm going to show you um, where the species accounts are that really get you into some of that uh, life history work, which that's real interesting. There's a life history stuff. And um, this early in the spring, I haven't really gotten my brain into it all yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, And I totally agree on the life history. I mean, that's all fascinating. And who the who the host plants are yep it's um, amazing to me right i totally agree so all right so i just wanted to go back to the uh, mass butterfly club species list and anything that you happen to be interested in um it's pretty simple um say you wanted to look at black swallowtail and you weren't sure um if you, um, and I want to do, um, what I want to do, so here we go. So we'll go down here. This is your black swallowtail. And I wanted to, you just scroll down to the different images. And I wanted to see the black form of the tiger swallowtail. And see that uh, now you can put those two side by side and see very clearly how different they are. So you wouldn't make the, you know, you could easily tell that this is not a black swallowtail because it totally lacks this inner, inner band of, of um, spots. And, um, and it's just, just a great thing to see, um, um, you know, different things in, in the different forms side by side. And uh, that to me is a real, is a real, you know, great uh, part of this web page, this website. 
So, um, and they can do that for any any two species you want. So, I'm going to go back and actually I'm going to go to the home page. And um, if you Google Mass Butterfly Club, uh, but we are going to we are going to send you the link. But um, this is the home page. It has a lot of information here. Um, if you want to um, butterfly information, um, again, the one interesting thing they have here that'll be useful for everybody is the um, the the flight dates. And <clears throat> as you go through the season, you'll have some butterflies, you know, starting up and others quitting. So if you look, get some black swallowtail. It's going to say that it, a few occurrences happen in April, but mostly in May, and they go all the way through the season, you know, ending out in October. Um, the giant swallowtail shows up in July to September, very unusual. Here's the um, eastern tiger swallowtail. Again, starts in May and goes through the whole season. The Canadian swallow, tiger swallowtail um, only has um, the one flight, so that it ends in early July. And so you can, you can look down through what you might find. Brown elephants in April, hoary elephant, frosted elephant, Henry's elephant, pine elephant. So, you know, these are all happening in April. So you look down this list of what else might be flying, question marks and commas and the tortoise shells. So anyway, so I find this to be a pretty useful tool to, um, to see, number one, <coughs> before you go out, you can kind of think what you might be able to find and you can look up what habitats they might be in and, and, um, and whatever. So, and the other thing, um, Hi, Dave. We have another question from yep. Mike. Yep. Um, he's, he's located on the south coast near New Bedford. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a handful of species we can find in Berkshire County in the Quabbin area, but can he expect to see these same species where he is? Um, <clears throat> some, of the, some of the ones that we've got in the western part of the state are actually uh, more northern or western species like the uh, the aphrodite and the atlantis fritillary um, and but also but if you look on the coast you're going to find things like cloudless sulfur will show up there um, and some of the other um, more southern um, things might come up so um, you, you've got a, a different set of 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 not central mass stuff you know central mass is a pretty good mix of things but if you get to the coast, you're going to wind up with some things that are more associated with Connecticut and New York than you are with um, up in the up in the Berkshires, which are going to be more of a Vermont, um, Canada-looking type bunch of species. Do you have any recommendations for hot spots out in that South Coast, New Bedford area, and how does one go about finding out more info on particular butterfly hotspots? Actually, there's um, there's information on this site that'll that'll get you there. Um, there's also um, two things that that you should um, be aware of. Um, there is a um, a butterfly listserv that if you go on the home page, I think that's where it's right here, and you subscribe to MassLep, and you just put your email in here and you subscribe. And that has a pretty good, a um, lot of people are on it and, um, and they report butterflies as they're seeing them. So you get kind of a, uh, um, a pretty good uh, account of, what, of what's happening. Um, you know, I'm not as, I used to, you know, places like Miles Standish have several really good butterflies. And actually the Butterfly Club takes trips to the southeastern part of the state. So although this year we're a little bit stymied by um, um, the whole thing but um, you know because right now everything through April has been canceled um, but they do go to the south coast so um, and I'm just trying to see but the if you go to this site they'll have PDFs of the field trips and there's also fourth of July counts which is another 
uh, big event that they do, you know, in each region all every year. So there's some pretty good information. If you look at the um, where the field trips are taking place, and you can contact the leaders and get more information directly from the leaders for each type of site. So that would certainly be uh, worth worth checking out. Okay. Um, so this butterflies of Massachusetts. People were asking um, about the um, you know, various uh, more information about host plants and whatnot. And um, if you look at the species list and you pick a group, um, let's say silver spotted skipper, I said was around, um, it's going to tell you the host plant information. So um, it'll go into fairly good detail. Um, this one probably isn't as much of a specialist, but uh, but it tells you that it may have arrived on Cape Cod through locust trees. Uh, it's not native to Cape Cod, but arrived on black locust. Interesting. So this page has information about, you know, that what Mary was asking about, some deep, uh, you know, deeper information about the various species, and it has a pretty good uh, number of species covered in this on this list. You know, um, yeah, there's a long list of species. You know, pipe vine swallowtail, it, it feeds on pipe vine, <laughs> you know. And that's another one that's, that's coming here more and more. Um, certainly is, um, um, I have a pipe vine in my yard and um, I don't get them every year, but I've had them several times. And, um, you know, that's the Dutchman's pipe vine and um, they're beautiful. And I totally expect, I've had them uh, lay, uh, you know, have, go through the whole process and the chrysalises did not make it over winter but uh, maybe some year they will. So, um, but you can see they have a kind of interruptive in their flight patterns. So a lot of information on these, on this page particularly. Dave, we have a question from Judy. Yep. Uh, sure. Should we be picking one citizen science program to report data over others? Uh, there are several programs you can use to report your findings. Would your data be counted twice if you use multiple programs to report the same finding? Yeah, okay, so um, I, I mentioned the two things. Um, I'm not sure that our volunteers at the Butterfly Club have quite figured out how to get it out of iNaturalist into the Butterfly Club database. So the Massachusetts database, you know, that we have here with the Mass Butterfly Club is very robust and it's pretty easy to get your uh, species, uh, your sighting recognized. And it's either by just posting it on the, you know, in an, in an email with the, with the, you know, the date, the species and the town location. You don't have to be more specific than that. Or on the, on the uh, MassLEP um, uh, Facebook page. And, you know, if you have a, a photograph that you want to share that's that's wonderful to to, to do that um, yeah i naturalist is the one that, that many of us are are moving toward and um it really is um um it may overtake everything else but um i want to try to keep this over 20 years of 25 years of um of record keeping on just butterflies, um, you know, going. And there's no problem if you um, report it both places at this point. That answered the question, all right? That just about does it for me. Any other questions for folks? And we will send you a, uh, a, a list of the links and um, about the books and about the websites and, um, and again, this Mass Butterfly Club site has a depth of information that uh, we only scratch the surface of. Yes, we have one more. We have yeah. a question from Lola. There we go, Lola. Okay. 
sorry. Um, of course, you're, you're not, the, the club is not doing field trips right now, uh, but we can still go out to a lot of places that are still available to us. Yeah. Do you have any specific places for this month that you would recommend that is ne that are near Northampton or, or let's say in the valley? Yeah, well, you know, the fish and wildlife properties are uh, are still open, and okay. it's more of a more of what's still open. Um, yeah, you know, um, many of your local conservation commission areas are open, and and really, um, you know, um, I'm just trying to think Northampton. You know, the East Meadows and stuff. There's plenty of uh, edge areas around those, and and okay. whatnot that you can still find some good stuff. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm walking uh, distance from the East Meadows. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know, I know the community gardens was closed, you know, um, which is, um, that's a real hot spot. There's a couple of uh, butterflies that, that uh, are growing butterfly plants instead of vegetables there, yeah. and it's really quite the hot spot. So, but usually later in the summer and fall when everything's really blooming, maybe things will be opened up by then, but the community garden is really a nice spot down there. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. We'll take a few more questions here. Thank you for the great question so far. We have another question from Judy. Is there a noticeable difference between the cloudless and orange sulfur? Yeah, cloudless is much larger. Um, and um, yeah, you, 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 can, uh, you can see quite a difference. You know, it's, and there uh, again, that's a late, um, it's a late season bug, um, you know, finding it particularly along the coast. Um, there was actually, um, there was actually one found in Petersam about a decade ago, which was really unusual. So um, uh, that, that was quite an interesting find. But, uh, but yeah, no, they're, they're, they're bigger. And, um, you know, again, look at the, at the website. It's got a bunch of pictures of it. We got another question from Elaine. Uh, are you going to do a dragonfly webinar? Um, I really hope to. Um, I think that may be my next one. That would probably wouldn't happen for about a month from now when the dragonflies start to perk up. But uh, if there's interest, I'd certainly be interested to try to put one together. Cool. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope you all had a great time. Uh, thank you, Dave, for presenting this valuable information. It was fantastic to learn about stuff. Um, I didn't know that the difference between butterflies and moths could just be their antennas. It's pretty <laughs> well, that's cool. a quick way to separate them. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd just sorry, like Dave. to kind of say too, Corey, thank to you and Kimlin Nugent for helping uh, pull this together. You know, our friends at Mount Grace and, you know, uh, these are tough times for all of our little nonprofits. We can't be doing our normal programming and, and uh, we appreciate all the support that we get from all of you. And uh, I was really pleased with the number of people that signed up and looks like we'll be looking towards a dragonfly event next month. And um, please uh, leave notes of, about what was right and what was wrong. And we'll try to even be smoother the next time around. <laughs> Okay. Yes, thank you all. And there is a survey at the end of this webinar when you exit. So if you'd like to leave some comments in there, that survey, please do. It'll help us in the future with our future webinars. Thank you so much.